2017. Hey guys, my name is Alex. Here is Yuri. Uh, we're working on advanced threat research team at Intel, and we're here to present the uh, new presentation: bearing the system, new vulnerabilities in core boot, and new Firebase system. Um, before we go to the presentation, I want to say thank you to the organizers of Recon, Hugo, Sam. You're awesome. Recon Brussels, awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, today we will present uh, the new type of vulnerability and uh, in our agenda we have uh, that small recap about the previous vulnerabilities, then introduction about memory map.io, then uh, description about MMIO bar overlap issue, examples of this issue in UEFI firmware and core boot firmware, limitations, mitigations, tools, and conclusion. The recap is really important for this presentation because the vulnerability is a little bit similar to the previous one and in many perspectives and exploitability in the modules when we found them. Like this? Okay, thank you. Uh, so what is um, a semi-poison pointer bug? So in x86 system, you have a couple privileged levels, and the most privileged is SMM. And there is a mechanism to communicate between the operation system and SMM mode. And the, it's, it's going like that. Um, operation system allocate the buffer, um, then pass the address of the buffer through some structure, depends on the version of the firmware, and then the SMM code read that buffer, and depends on functionality, it can read or write. In EDK1, uh, based firmware, the buffer, uh, the address of the buffer, we pass it through a general purpose register, RBX. Uh, in EDK2, there is a mechanism named COM buffer, and the address of COM buffer is passing through a UEFI ACPI table. And in normal behavior, uh, the, the address of this COM buffer is somewhere controlled by the operation system. But if we point in the address uh, back to SMM, SMM doesn't have a check, and we have arbitrary write in SMM code. Um, using this write primitive, we usually control the address where to write, but we not often control the data. At some of the exploits which we demonstrated previously, we are write zeros. And then to make an exploit, we find the structure in CPU safe state, um, uh, SM based register actually. And when we write this register, the next SMI will start executing from unprotected memory, and the uh, ring zero attacker um, can control it and make a privileged escalation to the SMM code. Then this vulnerability was fixed by adding the check in uh, SMI handlers. So, SMI handler check the, the address is not pointing to SMM. But what, we ha what if we have scenario when we have hypervisor? Or for example, hypervisor based uh, protection like VSM or just a Hyper-V with uh, root partition. In this case, we can point the address uh, in general purpose register or in COM buffer to some of the structure of the hypervisor and override it. And in this case, the un untrusted guest from ring zero um, make a privilege escalation to the hypervisor. Uh, the interesting fact is that even if this vulnerability is patched in the firmware and firmware is fully protected, the, uh, the untrusted guest can use it to make a privilege escalation like confused debit attack when there is no vulnerability but you can still exploit and make a code execution in the hypervisor. And we demonstrated the exploit to the VSM, which basically uses some uh, uh, firmware vulnerability uh, to compromise VSM and uh, dump credentials. Uh, we made this demo in 2015. Um, there was another example of uh, um, SMI pointer vulnerability uh, founded uh, by ATR and then published by uh, Sogiti Esec Lab. Um, the vulnerability is 
pretty similar that we found. So it reading the buffer from the general purpose register, but the buffer to the function read flash data. And in the function read flash data, it using the function read, and you controlling the offset of the destination, you controlling the source and the size. And you, in this case, there is no checks where the address will be, so if you address is in the SMRM, you can dump and read and write SMM. Um, really nice write-up. Write also, Dmitry Alexiuk published many couple presentation, couple blog posts about different type of SMM point of vulnerabilities. Um, so, how the community and vendors react on this, how we fix it. Um, there is a protection which I already mentioned to check that the address not pointing to the SM SMRAM and through function SMM is buffer outside SMM valid. It fixes the problem with the firmware, but it doesn't fix the problem with the hypervisor and the vulnerability and the bypass privilege escalation to the hypervisor. So to fix this vulnerability, there was another mitigation added uh, to the limit com buffer address. And the f so address now should be fixed. And there is an ACPI table um, named Windows SMM mitigation ACPI table, which is basically should be initialized by the firmware and written by the operation system, which is passing the configuration of the mitigation. And there is a couple bits there. One is defining that the common buffer is fixed and in a defined location, and the SMM is checking all of the input and output buffer. Another one is nested, that meaning that if you have a pointer inside the COM buffer, it's checking these pointers as well. And uh, another protection is um, that you have locked uh, some of the configuration of the hardware after exit boot uh, during the exit boot services. Uh, for example, uh, interrupt controller, IUMMU, and so on. And that kind of mitigation was added after we published this research and communicated with vendors. Um, a little bit about MMIO because this bug is really um, rely on the different behavior of the MIO. Um, in, in X86 system, to communicate to the device, uh, there is PCI Express protocol and in this protocol, there is a fabrics which, which contain multiple um, components that components uh, interconnected to certain topologies. Uh, in this topology, there is a root complex which has multiple ports. There is endpoints, switches, bridges. All of them is connected via a PCI Express link. Uh, every uh, physical component has up to eight virtual physical functions, and all of, in some of them. Uh, may integrate to the road complex. So basically, this protocol is allowing to talk to the device and send DMA and so on. Every device has PC config space in a device, and that PC config space contains the header of the the, the header. Uh, then it contains the PC Express capability structure and the extensions. So the entire structure is 4K, uh, but without extensions, it's uh, uh, 256 bytes. To get the access to the PCI and PC configuration, there is two interfaces. One is to get access to PCIe configuration space using port uh, IO uh, CF8 CFC. When we uh, construct the address, knowing the bus device and function and offset which we want to read from the specific device, and then the pass it through the CFC, we can read and write to specific register in PCIe configuration. To get access to the extended configuration space, we need to use an enhancing configuration access mechanism, which is implemented as memory map, so it basically um, memory, which is split by four kilobytes per each bus device function, and through that memory we can access to the extension configuration space of the device and read the register from there. So to read them, we are using uh, MMIO control uh, memory map uh, config register plus bus multiply 32 multiply 8 multiply 1K plus device multiply 8 multiply 1K plus function plus offset. Then we construct the address, then we use it as a memory access, and we can read and write registry. So uh, there are basically 
all of that configuration, all of that uh, PCIe configuration is for storing some configuration registry for the device. But even 4K was not enough for modern devices. They want to store much more, like graphics want to store megabytes. And here was the era when MMIO became. So the MMIO is the range of memory, and access to that range is forwarding to the device, and device will handle that. And this range is defined through MMIO bars, and MMIO bars is in PCIe config space, which we are talking on the previous slide. And if you see, like, there is a header of the PCIe um, configuration space, and there is device ID, there is a vendor ID, status registry, some other register, and then the base, the base address zero is the first uh, MMIO bar. As you see here, there is just the address, so we don't know the size. The, the, um, the bars itself, they are self-aligned, meaning if you write all Fs to the bar, the bits which didn't flip from zero to one is the bits which define the size of the um, MMIU bar. For example, if there is one byte didn't flip, then meaning that you have uh, the 256 um, size of the bar, 256 byte. Um, here is the simplified version of the layout in the memory, just to get the small um, um, representation of where SMMIO is. So we have a low DRAM, then there is SMM protected by SMRI, so there is a graphic memory, then we have TOLUT, and there is a memory map config, then there is low DRAM with all of the bar which was defined through PCIe config space and there is a direct map and BIOS, and there we have Hydra. So all of the bars should be defined somewhere here. And here is a couple examples of the MMIO bars. There is the name of the bar, like GTT MMADR, which is, has um, the address of 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 10, with 10 is uh, offset, and then it has the size, the two megabytes, so all of them is you can use a chipset tool to just run a MMIO list and enumerate the known PCIe bars, uh, MMIO bars, sorry. So one of the important aspects of the MMIO range registry, um, MMIO bars, is that they can be reallocatable at runtime and OS can reallocate them to any other location. Some of the MMIO bars is not reallocatable. They are fixed or locked by the firmware, but some of them is reallocated. And now Yuri will explain why it is an issue. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> I take it you can hear me. So I've just, uh, I've just noticed that uh, all of the animation that I spent hours on is pretty much gone from the slides. That's convenient. That's, I guess, the difference between PowerPoint and PowerPoint Viewer. Uh, anyway, so how is that related to what Alex has uh, been talking about? These issues are um, depend on this memory mapped I.O. configuration behavior. And in fact, they are kind of caused by the way firmware uh, um, um, talks to the devices, um, talks to the devices through the memory mapped I.O. Uh, so the way, the, the way firmware uses um, this memory map to you mechanism and communicates with the devices is that, and this is specifically to the SMI handlers, but uh, keep in mind that the entire firmware, including the boot firmware, regardless of which type of firmware that is, UEFI-based firmware or core boot-based firmware or just legacy BIOS or anything, anything else, um, also talks to the devices through the memory mapped um, I.O. Uh, mechanism. So. There is a uh, PCI configuration space in each device, or actually each virtual device or a function of a device, uh, PCI config header. And it has, a, uh, it has this base address register, which defines the, the, the base of the memory range for that particular device. And so uh, what usually SMI handlers do, as well as any other firmware, uh, boot firmware, um, they get the base register, they read the base register to get the base address of this LMI range, and then 
they either read registers within that range, MOI registers, or write those registers, or read, modify, write those registers. So basically, in order to uh, send uh, I.O. cycles to, uh, uh, to the particular device. And so, yeah. Uh, so this is how they uh, essentially communicate with the devices. Now, the problem, the uh, theory of the problem, becomes that there is an implicit trust assumption on the firmware side, on the firmware part, that those are hardware registers. So therefore, they are part of the hardware, and hardware is part of the trust uh, boundary. And so basically, firmware, for the most, for the, for the most part, trusts all of the hardware, right, I including those registers. So there's an assumption that nobody can change those registers. However, those are just uh, ring zero accessible um, registers that could be uh, modified by any ring zero code, right? So that's one example of what uh, the uh, ring zero code, OS level code can do, or the, uh, the code, the ring, ring three code, if it has enough privileges to uh, talk to the PCI config space let's say, modify PCI config registers like this bar register. So, um, so the, uh, the problem is that the string zero code or OS level code can modify those bar registers and relocate the range for a particular device uh, somewhere else in physical address addressable space. It could be somewhere in other MMIO. It could be overlapping with some other things. But it could also, can also be in the DRAM uh, in the system memory, and specifically one particular location where the uh, attacker would be interested in is the uh, system management mode memory. So the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the exploit code could modify and relocate the memory uh, mapped I.O. range uh, to overlap with the SMRAM. Then when SMI uh, interrupt is generated, either by hardware or by the uh, attack code itself, uh, the um, uh, the firmware, so my handler firmware, attempts to communicate with the device through this memory map layer range. Attempts to read registers or write registers. And so basically, uh, instead of actually sending cycles to the device as MMIO cycles, uh, which are memory cycles on the PCI bus, uh, it sends memory transactions to its own memory or some other memory, depending on where the attack code relocated this MMIO range. Uh, so that potentially can either expose data because it reads its own memory or basically modify, modify the control flow somehow if it reads some attacker manipulated data. Or uh, it can potentially corrupt the memory because of the memory write cycles to, to the MMIO registers. Um, so that's the theory of the, um, this problem. And what we've observed in multiple types of firmware, including UFI and Corbett firmware, are, is that the SMI handlers communicate with a lot of uh, MMIO bars. And examples include uh, EHCI, USB 2 bars, um, 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 Gigabit Ethernet LAN, um, Root Complex MMIO, that's the main MMIO for the PCHs. Uh, or specifically the spy registers, then basically in order to communicate with the spy flash, write to the spy flash or read from the spy flash. Uh, HCI, SATA controller, MMIO, uh, XHCI, USB 3 controller, integrated graphics device, um, MMIO, basically GTT MMA DR um, uh, range for the graphics uh, device. Or some other MMIOs, like for example, the, I think it's a LED controller or something. Uh, the, on, on, on a different bus on the specific systems. Um, it, could be, it could be more. This is what we've uh, seen. Uh, it, could be, it could be more. So there might be a specific system that has a specific SMI handler which communicates with a specific device. Or maybe has uh, some functionality uh, specific to that system communicating with a generic device. Oh. So this is an example. Uh, this is an example of uh, communicating with the spy controller in order to read something from spy flash or write something to use spy flash. So uh, there's a command basically. Uh, uh, the first command is attempting to store a persistent configuration for the UEFI firmware into the spy flash. It's called UEFI variable if you're familiar, but basically it's the, uh, uh, it's the configuration of the firmware. 
So this is the first command that attempts to store something into the spy flash, this configuration. And the second command just dumps the, uh, the uh, this SPI memory, ma uh, memory map range, all the registers. I, uh, I don't show all the registers here, I'm just showing the uh, registers that I'm interested in. And so you can see that there's a uh, SPI status and control register which tells the status of the SPI, SPI cycle and also sends, uh, sends that SPI cycle on the SPI bus. Uh, there's a there's an SPI flash address. It's the uh, it's the register that is programmed with the uh, flash uh, address in, on the on the SPI flash device. And there's also a whole bunch of uh, registers that are programmed with the contents of what you want to write to the SPI flash, or what you want to read from the SPI flash. So in this particular case, this is the contents of that variable that I've been writing in the first command. So you can see all 42, 42, that's B, right? So the, the, the contents of the variable was all Bs. And, and you can see that all of these registers now contain the, the contents of the variable. Um, so obviously, if we overlap this SPI MMI range with, with something else like the, uh, uh, the, the SMRAM or, or some other page protected, uh, uh, then we can cause the, the, this contents of the variables written on, onto, that, onto that range. So how do we find uh, this type of issue? So obviously, you know, uh, it, you know as, as my handler is writing something to spy bar or to, uh, sorry, to any MMI bar. Um, so it looks like uh, to find all those problems, it's just easy as uh, dump the contents of the MMI range, then cause the SMI, and then dump again and see which registers changed in the SMI. Uh, and now you know that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the SMI handler modified those registers. Unfortunately, this is a, um, <coughs> uh, a lot more complex than that. And initially, we thought it, it would be very similar to identify those issues at runtime, but in reality, it's pretty complex. Uh, and the reason is because those are not memory contents. So in addition to firmware, other parties are also writing to those registers. So the hardware itself, the devices or integrated controllers or some logic in the hardware, writes to those registers in pretty much any MMI bar. Uh, for example, uh, some of the bars like graphics bars, the, uh, the, uh, the hardware writes to thousands of registers in the, in the, in the MMI range. So it's pretty difficult to uh, actually identify which registers are, has, have been modified by the, um, by the SMI code itself. Uh, so that's kind of a high level all entire flow have we kind of uh, solved that problem. So basically what we do is, uh, is that we, for every MMI range, we dump the MMI range multiple times with a delay, let's say 20 times, and we find all of the registers that, are, that normally change without SMI handlers. So we add those registers to the list and call it a normal difference or something like that. And then we trigger SMIs or cause a function like the variable write that would trigger an SMI. Um, and then we ever, 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 ever uh, af sorry, after uh, every SMI, we dump that range again, uh, see which registers have changed, and compare them with that normal difference, with the registers that normally change. If we see any new register that is not part of that normal difference, basically, we suspect that this register might have been changed in the SMI handler. So we send an SMI, the same SMI again, maybe even multiple times to confirm that this register changes every time we send the same SMI. And even with that mechanism, there are lots of false positives because even when we create normal difference, uh, we don't catch all of the registers. So it happens that uh, when you trigger an SMI, some register changes, but it's not really because of the SMI handler, but because of the device decided that at this moment, I want to write to that new register. Oh, awesome. That's not the end. Yeah. So that's an example, essentially, just uh, just uh, of running this sort of a tool that uh, monitors the uh, the uh, the changes in the in, in the uh, MMI bars. This particular example monitors changes in the uh, EHCI, e EHCI USB bar, uh, and you can see that. Uh, uh, then it 
then it, it created normal difference uh, with just two registers, normal change. Then it triggered uh, multiple SMIs, and the first SMI it found that one register, additional register changed, so it re-triggered that SMI again, and that register didn't change. It's it's it, it's it's also it also can be an ex, uh, a false negative as well because uh, uh, you know the SMI handler might be flipping a bit, flipping one, flipping back, and so on. But this is a suspect to investigate later. So uh, this was a theory about the uh, the, the issues. Um, so now I'll give you a few examples of those issues in UFI firmware as well as in Core Boot. So we'll start with the UFI. Um, so how do we uh, how do we find those issues in the binary? Let's say we have a uh, EFI binaries. Uh, we load them in IDA, uh, in IDA, and uh, uh, and uh, how do we find those? So one way of finding a, uh, those type of issues is you you can you can find places where SMI handlers or the firmware um, um, that reads the contents of the base address register, and because we know their addresses for every device, we know the address of the base address register. So for example, uh, this. Um, GBE LAN MMIO bar. Uh, it has a multiple MMI ranges. Uh, one of them is so called uh, uh, um, uh, MMIO bar A, M bar, uh, which is defined by the offset 10 hex. And the GBE LAN device is the bus 0 device 25, also 29, I think, um, uh, function 0. So the, uh, if the firmware, the firmware can use two mechanisms, as Alex described. The one is the legacy mechanism through the uh, CF8, CFC IO ports, and one is enhanced mechanism through the memory map, uh, memory map config space. So the first mechanism um, used with, with, and the address of that bar register for the first mechanism is calculated as, uh, you know, device number, uh, left shift 11 bits, plus the uh, offset. There's also, of course, bus number, uh, left shift, 15 bits, I think, uh, um, and, uh, and the function number. But in this case, bus zero and, and, and function zero. So we have, we have an address uh, of that register, um, which is pretty unique in, in, in a lot of cases uh, when it's used for, uh, with the legacy PCI config access mechanism. And when you set enable bit for the PCI config cycle, which is bit 31, then you have uh, 8 and uh, C810. For the uh, the same my bar of GB LAN device. So for the second mechanism, it's uh, it's calculated similarly. So you have you have uh, uh, a memory map config space divided into four kilobyte chunks for each device, bus device function, and the register is some somewhere within the uh, four kilobyte chunk for that particular device. And so uh, you need to add a uh, memory map config base address of this memory map config space. And you need to add an offset. You need to find uh, this four kilobyte chunk within the uh, memory map config space, and then you need to find the register within that four kilobyte chunk. So you calculate the uh, the offset to that register uh, pretty pretty similarly. But it, but remember that that this mechanism allows you to access all of the uh, uh, PCIe header, uh, all of the four kilobytes of registers, rather than 100 reg uh, 256 bytes of registers. Uh, so uh, that's why you have C8010 instead of C810 as in the previous. So you have a constant. You have, a, you have this total address in memory, physical address in memory for that particular bar. Now you can identify all the places where firmware uses that bar or reads that bar. Uh, once you do that, um, once you do that, you can uh, figure out if the firmware, how the firmware uses that bar. Does it check that the address is somewhere else, or uh, does it not? Right. So, does it read or write to the registers in the bar? So, this is the uh, this is the example for the GB LAN MOIO bar in the device 25. This is the uh, the, the the first. We call it MBARA MOIO, the yellow thing, and the second. Uh, no, sorry, the third axis, the third constant, you can see F80C80CC. That's reading configuration uh, register from uh, the uh, GB LAN config space, but it's a different register. It's a power management control status register. So the bar itself is the F80C80010. Uh, that's one of the reds. Uh, 
And uh, so that, that's, the, that, that's, that's where firmware reads the, uh, the actual address of the bar. And uh, now then, later on, you can see that the firmware is, is, a, is, is actually writing or reading some registers in that bar. It's not very clear on this particular screenshot, so it's better to uh, look at it at the next screenshot. Now you can see that the firmware is using that MMI range and bar range and writing some values. Uh, there's uh, writing some, uh, some uh, register that the attacker controls or writing some constant value, let's say this 7, 1, 2, 3, I don't know what that constant is, to the uh, 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 address or offset 32 decimal in this MBAR MMIO. So it's writing some values to the registers. And so this is the, without actually checking, so uh, there's no check for that MMIO range, whether it's overlaps with uh, uh, SMRAM or whether it's overlapping with, uh, uh, it's overlapping with something else. So there's no checking. So basically by modifying MBARA in the config space uh, of that GBLAN device, you could potentially control uh, where uh, the SMI handler is writing data. This is another example for the USB MMI bar, <clears throat> and it's pretty similar. So you calculate, oh great, I didn't actually uh, put the, the actual final constant, but uh, uh, you can see that there is a USB uh, a base address register is, uh, is read um, from the offset 10 hex of the uh, EHCI MMIO uh, uh, controller. And then the, there are accesses to the offsets of that range, uh, access to uh, offset 20 at the bottom of the slide, uh, where it flips the bits. It doesn't write controlled values, it just flips the bits. Um, so, and this is also an example where the, uh, the um, you know, in this, in this assembly you don't, you don't see the actual constant, the actual, the full address uh, in the memory map config space because the address is, uh, is calculated. But you do see a, an address of the uh, memory map config space, then you see the, the, the offset of the bar register. So there are multiple kind of ways to do that. So it, it's, it also helps with finding those issues. It also helps to find the actual functions uh, that read or write configuration space. So the first function on the left, it actually it, it uses the uh, legacy uh, PCI configuration mechanism through CFA TFC. You can see uh, CFA TFC ports there. Uh, the bottom the bottom one is using extended mechanism. It uses memory map configuration access. Um, uh, to uh, read write configuration registers. Uh, the, the write part is just an example how firmware uses that. So you can see that uh, it writes, um, um, it, it reads the um, uh, register B8 in a device 31 and then writes some value to, uh, to that register. So read, modify, write. Uh, yeah, it actually yeah, it, it, it writes and then returns. So basically what, it, what, it's, what it's doing, it's, uh, it's clearing status bits, most likely. Um, so those were examples in the UFI firmware. Let's talk about those examples in the core boot. By now you probably understood that these issues are not, are not really specific to the type of firmware used, because those issues are depending on the platform architecture. Uh, it's the firmware trying to communicate with the device, PCIe device endpoint devices uh, on the PCIe on the platform that adheres to PCIe architecture. So, regardless of which type of firmware ha you, you have, core boot or a legacy BIOS or a UFI based BIOS, those issues might exist. So, because we have a source code for a core boot. And by the way, uh, I just wanted to thank Corbo team and Ron uh, uh, in particular for um, kind of uh, working with us on this. So because we have a, uh, a source code for Corbit, we can look at the source code. So in order to find those issues on, 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 uh, uh, on Corbit, you, uh, you can do this. Um, you can find the functions that read PCIe uh, configuration registers as in the previous, uh, previous slides. Uh, in the source code, and then you can find functions that are writing to the memory map type ranges. So in particular in Corbett, those are functions, uh, PCI read config 32, 
or PCI read config 16 um, to read the configuration registers. And then functions write 16, write 32, or read 16, read 32 in order to read or write memory mapped registers. Uh, so in this, in this particular case, uh, uh, you can see that the, the firmware is reading the um, MMIO range from a integrated graphics device um, at offset 10 hex. And then it's writing some register to the PP control uh, offset of that range in the graphics range with a specific, uh, with a specific value, which, is, which it's calculating before. Um, sometimes in the source code, obviously the, uh, the developers are naming the bars with their names as they defined in the, uh, 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 in the uh, uh, platform specs or uh, chipset specs or SOC specs. And so, for example, on Intel systems, you can you can you can find those access by just uh, most of the most of the bars by the, by their names, uh, either RCBA or SPI bars by uh, MMIO or PCI base address and, and so on. So you can look up the bar register names and just essentially just grab all the source code by by the names. Uh, so that's a um, that's a particular example in a uh, um, mainboard I.O. trap handler, SMI handler in Corbett. Uh, so the, uh, this SMI handler, it's not a software SMI handler, so it's not the SMI handler that you would trigger by writing some value into the B2 register, I.O. Uh, port. It's an SMI handler that is caused by the chipset uh, on trapping of I.O. cycle to some other port. It's called I.O. trap mechanism. I uh, won't describe in details that mechanism, but basically it's another way to trigger a lot of SMI handlers in, 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 on, on the platforms. Probably the second most used mechanism to generate SMI hand, uh, SMIs. Uh, and so what this uh, SMI handler does, it reads um, a MMI range base address uh, from, a bus, uh, from a device zero on bus one at offset one, uh, 18 hex. Um, it reads the address, and then it's checking one register. It's called LVTMA BL mode level uh, in that in that MMI range. It checks whether the value is greater than 10 hex. If it is, then it tries to either you know, decrease it. If it's less than F0, then it tries to increase it. So what it's doing is essentially it's uh, it's trying to change the brightness, and you probably don't see this. Yeah, so basically when you press the button on that core boot system, it would generate an SMI, and depending on which button you pressed, it decreases the brightness of the screen or increases the brightness of the screen. So it, it does that by writing, by reading the contents of the register, incrementing or decrementing the contents of the register, and then writing it back. So basically, potentially by pressing the button, uh, you can, and, and overlapping that bar with something else like SMRAM, uh, you can cause the SMI handler to override itself and, 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 and get the uh, potentially memory corruption or code execution. Um, um, or the uh, ring zero attacker might generate that SMI on your behalf without the press, pressing the button. So another case is, uh, Another case in um, uh, Corbett firmware is another SMI handler. It's called uh, Backlight Off, uh, which is very similar, but it's triggered when you press the power button and the system goes to S5, soft shutdown. And so uh, SMIs are generated, the firmware takes control, it needs to turn off devices, including it wants to turn off the brightness, of, well, not brightness, it needs to turn off the, uh, the this backlight uh, to to the screen, and so I don't remember the specific system that this is my handler was on, but basically what it's doing it's again it's reading a uh, register base, the base for the MMI device uh, for the uh, for the MMIO range of the integrated graphics device, and it also writes a different value to the same uh, PP control register. Um, on um, entering S5. 
so potentially by entering S5, you can uh, control the value of the offset in, in the memory um, uh, that you overlapped, uh, well, in the memory that you overlap with the, uh, with the graphics device of Mayo Bar. Uh, or uh, the attacker in this case would need to simulate the S5 event, trigger event, and uh, prevent the system from going actually into the S5, but uh, still causing the SMI handler by just directly calling that SMI handler. Um, so uh, by now you might have figured that there are lots of moving parts in this type of bugs, in this type of issues. There are limitations. The first limitation for the exploit is that the SMI handlers or any other firmware is writing to specific offsets. So you don't really control, fully control the address. You don't have an arbitrary write uh, primitive. You, 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 you only control the base address plus the offset. Um, and uh, the bars, like Alex mentioned, most of the bars are self-aligned or size-aligned. So if you have a four kilobyte large bar, uh, the uh, MMI range, then it's aligned on a four kilobyte boundary. Um, this is not a requirement. This is most of the platforms do that. But uh, architecturally, PCI SIG, PCI architecture, defined that the bars uh, might be as small as 16 bytes and aligned at 16 bytes. So there might be a, there might be a MMI ranges that are as uh, as small as 16 bytes, and you pretty much have a fine granularity of the address that you control. But uh, for four kilobyte bytes, you have pretty uh, yeah quite a, quite a few possibilities uh, to override, but for larger bars, let's say 16 kilobytes, that's, that becomes uh, more difficult. For bars that are even larger, like the graphics device bar, um, those bars are two megabyte large or four megabyte large. Uh, you have a very few uh, possibilities. And the exploit may not be able to control the values that are written because uh, the uh, the firmware or the SMI handlers typically write specific values or flip specific bits at those offsets or even read a value, then modify it somehow and, and, and write or read the value and write to some other register. So, um, so you, you, don't, you, you, may, you may not, the exploit may not, not control the, the, the values. Although, as you saw for some MMI ranges, the, uh, the exploit might control. So, for example, in the variable write uh, example, you saw all of the contents of the variable that you fully control. Um, <clears throat> the other limitation is that because those are uh, memory mat I.O. ranges, those are not regular memory DRAM ranges, then that means that the firmware is actually implementing a protocol in a lot of cases. So, it's not just writing, like, I, I want to write zero to this offset. No, it usually implements some sort of protocol, and protocol could be as simple as read the value if that value has some, you know, if the, if that register has specific value or it's greater or less than something, then write to somewhere else. That's uh, easily controllable because uh, you don't just relocate the bar into memory; you also create the contents in memory of all of the registers as if they were in the uh, MMI range, so you can you can control that. But if the protocol is more complex, like for example, uh, the, the the firmware is issuing specific cycles on a specific bus, then it's typically uh, writing to some registers, then reading back other registers, pulling on the values in those registers, then writing some 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 something else. Uh, so in that case, you may not really be able to. Uh, uh, control that because you only have one chance. You populated the uh, fake MMI range in memory, and if the firmware writes something and expects it to change, uh, then you're out of luck because you don't have any agents running in parallel. In certain cases, that might be bypassable in platforms, but in larger cases, you're out of luck in this case. Um, so, Plus, there are lots of conditions. The SMI handler will write to that bar depending on, let's say, platform mode. Uh, is, are we in a CPI mode or not? Is the, um, uh, is the device I'm communicating with supporting this functionality, this, uh, this mode or, or this feature, right? 
and plus even triggering those SMIs that um, communicate with the devices might even cause some complications because it's not as just you trigger SMI through writing to port B2. No, those SMI handlers, as you saw, might be caused when you enter S3 or exit S3, resume from S3, or when you enter a soft shutdown or something like that. So kind of a complications on how you even trigger the, 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 the interrupts. Um, so yeah, and um, for certain number of bars that are non-architectural, basically they're not defined in the PCI compatible space uh, um, uh, below 40 hex in the PCI header, uh, those bars um, might be locked down by the firmware. So there is a mechanism in the hardware that allows you to just lock down the, uh, the, the register and uh, uh, after you lock it down until, uh, until reset, nobody can change. So you cannot, for those bars, you cannot relocate them. Uh, of course, the firmware might forget to lock them down, as uh, we saw many times, but in that case, you can relocate even lockable bars. But if firmware doesn't forget to lock down all the bars, then uh, you cannot relocate them to memory. You can relocate something else and overlap with the bar, but that's a different story. So uh, what are the options for to mitigate those attacks? One option is that uh, uh, the SMI handlers can verify that the address, base address of the MMI range that it read from the bar register doesn't overlap with SMRAM. That's a pretty straightforward mitigation, and it's similar to the mitigation that was done for the previous type of class of issues, the pointer bugs, and it should be done. Uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to really check the pointer that, it, you're, that you're not writing to your own code. But it, it only solves the uh, problem partially. It prevents you from overriding the contents of SMRAM, but it doesn't prevent you from pointing that uh, uh, address uh, that you will write to to something else outside of SMRAM. Let's say hypervisor protected pages or Windows 10 VBS protected pages. Um, so in that case, uh, the mitigation might be a difference. You, the, the, the firmware and SMI handlers might verify that the address, base address of the MMI range is actually in the MMIO. In the memory map that you saw from Alex's part of the presentation, it's above this top um, uh, of low usable DRM. So you can check that the bar is actually in that range and not overlapping, not pointing somewhere inside the DRAM. Um, that's a good mitigation, although you still might be writing to somewhere you shouldn't have been able to write. So it's also partial mitigation, I think. Uh, so there is another option uh, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the firmware and SMI handlers might do is um, when the, the, the system boots, the boot firmware might allocate the default range, the reserved range in the MMIO and place all the bars there and, all, and, and when the SMI handlers are invoked at runtime uh, during the OS execution, then the SMI handler might check the value of the base address for the MMI range and uh, you know, check if it's within this default reserved range. If it's not, uh, force it into the default range, it's in the it's default location, and use the default location. And then upon exit, just restore the value or leave it there. Or, depends on the firmware implementation. So in this case, you're just forcing the, the, that the, uh, the SMI handler runtime firmware will write to a uh, known good location, kind of fixed location for the MMI. And that's, uh, that particular third mitigation was, uh, was done for the spy bar uh, example with the arbitrary contents of the variable that could be written by the, uh, by the, by the exploit. So in that case, uh, starting later, uh, Skylake systems, uh, I think the, uh, um, uh, the boot firmware allocates the range at FE01 and four zeros in physical addressable, physical addressable space um, for the SPI MMIO range. And so on any uh, SMI, PCH type SMI, the chipset type SMI, the, the, the SMI handler checks that the base address of the SPI MMIO range is uh, uh, at that address. And if it's not, then it uh, basically over, uh, overrides it with, uh, with the default um, um, uh, FE01 value, uh, then, you will, then the SMI handler proceeds doing what it's need, what it needs to do, um, um, and basically kind of a preventing you from overlapping the range with anything else that you shouldn't have access to. 
Uh, so that's a kind of a, a screenshot uh, with this example of, the, of this mitigation. Uh, first, the attacker relocates this uh, a spy bar, overlaps it with something else, just regular DRM memory, then causes the uh, variable write um, um, that um, um, generates an SMI. Uh, and upon exit from the SMI, the uh, um, I'm, I'm just checking the value of the spy bar, and you can see that it actually changed to the to its default location. Um, so I'll, um, I'll basically try to show you that on this system. Um, you may not be able to see that on the back, uh, uh, but uh, you know. You can later on. You can you can check. So I'm reading a um, offset 10 hex in the device 31 function 5. That's the SPI controller on later systems. So I'm reading, and you can see it has value FE um, 01 um, four zeros. Ooh. Yeah. On this laptop, the. Uh, the keyboard is typing numbers on its own without my help. <laughs> uh, so now we'll check the uh, just the number of SMIs. You can see that 15 hex uh, SMIs has been generated so far. Um, then then I'm relocating the bar. Yeah. So I'm sorry, since I started showing that with the individual commands. So I'm relocating the bar to this address, which is in memory. I, uh, before the presentation, I prepared it uh, and um, copied contents of the spy bar into that memory. Um, Uh, so, okay, checking the bar again. So you can see that it relocated, now it points the SPI, SPI um, SPI memory map range, now it points to DRM. And then I'm writing contents of the variables. Um, you can see that the write was successful, even though the SMI handler should not have access to the SPI controller in this case, because I relocated to some bogus memory. It's not a SPI MMIO uh, range anymore, any longer. So it's already a sign that, hey, the attack didn't really succeed. Um, yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm reading the, the contents of the bar again, and you can see that it, it got restored to uh, the original location. I'm checking the value of the SMI, and you saw 15 there, now it's 19 hex. So you got four SMI generated uh, during this operation, one per logical CPU. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm checking the contents of the, of the bar, so uh, MMIO dump SPI bar, yeah, not at this address. I'll just uh, dump it to somewhere here. SPI log. And you can see that the contents of the variable that I wrote are actually in the uh, MMI range. So the variable that I wrote is uh, is this. It has all, all of the... Uh, it, all, it has all of the Bs, so 40, 42 hex. So um, that basically shows that this laptop, uh, um, this, this system, uh, restores the SPI MMI range to default location and, um, and, um, um, and then only then proceeds to communicate with the SPI uh, flash uh, device. All right, so um, we will have a couple of tools that can find those issues. Uh, at runtime, obviously, you can you can proceed with uh, you know the the uh, disassembling uh, uh, the uh, binaries or looking at the source code. But uh, we will release um, 
couple of tools that will help finding those issues. Um, so one is that just um, um, finds all of the registers that the SMI handlers writes to modify, and the other one is uh, is the one that attempts to actually relocate all the MMI ranges into uh, uh, memory, uh, then FOS the SMIs and and see the uh, if the memory contents changed. None of these tools are perfect; um, um, they give false positives, false false negatives. So it's more of a um, kind of a they need to be a um, um, complemented with uh, manual analysis. So uh, the root causes that of this type of issues is that the firmware assumes that the, all of the hardware is trusted, including all of the um, you know, registers in the uh, uh, configuration registers for all the hardware devices or the entire chipset. Uh, that, are not, that, are, that are not modified by some malicious code, um, for example, uh, lockdown. Um, and so uh, the firmware shouldn't assume that the contents of the base address registers are um, immutable because any ring zero code can modify most of them and they can be relocated to anywhere in memory including on top of the SMRAM itself uh, and so um, therefore kind of a check the contents or addresses of those registers. It, this problem is not specific to the SMM because the, uh, you know, the, the SMM is a pretty obvious target here because there, there's a runtime firmware, but the, even the, the, the boot firmware that um, um, reads contents of uh, some of the registers upon, let's say, uh, resume from sleep uh, using the boot script or uh, c reads contents of the uh, MMI ranges from somewhere else like UFI variables, uh, it also can be you know, tricked into using uh, memory ranges which are not really MMI ranges but some something else and potentially can override its own code. So it, uh, the, the boot firmware should do the same thing as the runtime firmware. Uh, so I think that's all. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, thank you for listening. Hello. Uh, thanks, guys, for your talk. Um, so you were talking about kind of with the goal in mind of getting code execution in the context of the SMI. Um, but have you seen this type of attack utilized in a virtualized environment where if you're a guest in a hypervisor that's allowing pass-through to PCI devices, um, causing relocation so that you would overwrite into the uh, host kernel or something like that to break out? Um. Yeah, thanks, Rich, for the question. So um, we haven't verified all of the hypervisors, but um, um, but we have done some analysis on, uh, um, um, let's say, VSM, and when you are in Windows 10, um, normal world partition, it allows you to write to the uh, bar registers. So um, we have not done the full analysis of whether this can be used or cannot be used as an attack, but at least the, uh, the entry points are, uh, are there. And uh, for other hypervisors, um, if that would be possible to use this type of attacks uh, against the hypervisors, then that would be might be possible from uh, administrative guests only, not from unprivileged guests. Okay, and then uh, one other quick question. You were talking about a lot of the behavior um, in the SMIs is to do a read, modify, and write. Um, so I was just thinking like this vector, if you had an offset into a kernel where you would have a predictable increment of that counter, uh, is there a way basically to block it and loop that increment in normal behavior? Does that make sense? It, it does. I, 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 I definitely not not sure that there's a way to block it in, on the kernel level. But also, um, I don't think you would attack the kernel itself with this because in, a, in, 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 the, uh, in the general case, you have to have uh, an access to the PCI configuration space of the devices, so in order to relocate the memory map to base, base addresses somewhere else in the, uh, in the memory, um, and that already assumes that you have right access to the PCI config space, which is ring zero in majority of the cases.
So I, I, uh, you wouldn't use this attack to uh, attack kernel, I guess. Right. Well, I was thinking in the virtualized environment, but yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, thank you. Yeah. On the virtualized environment, sorry, on the, in the virtualized environment, the hypervisor might prevent, of course, the first way to prevent that is to not allow any guest, including administrative guest, to, from uh, um, uh, not allow to modify the base address of MIO ranges. That's the first and yeah, pretty straightforward and should be done. Um, but you can also monitor memory with, uh, uh, with extended page tables and cause APT violations on certain events, but that would be, I, I guess, performance heavy. Hi, thanks for the interesting talks. I have a question regarding the relocation of the MMI bar uh, register that you are talking about in the last uh, slides. You tell, told that some uh, new uh, SMI handler uh, may verify the context of the register and restore it to the original location, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the sort of things that I have not understood is that the hardware has uh, designed this for a reason, that maybe some device can, uh, would like to um, relocate the uh, MMIO bar register for some uh, reason of uh, accessing the memory mapper register. And uh, my question is, how can you recognize when it's legal to do that or it's not legal to do that? I mean, there is uh, some way to trigger an SMI handler that is an hardware one from software. Um. Let me see, Andrea. Uh, you had like multiple questions in the same <laughs> in the same question. So, is it legal to um, modify the uh, um, um, you know which software legitimately can modify the base address registers for the uh, for the MI bars? Exactly. Um, generally, PCI can, PCI architecture allows OS to relocate MMI ranges any time any any time at once. Uh, in a lot of cases, I don't think that happens often, rather than when uh, OS just um, you know bits. But uh, this is a, a PCI architectural um, capability, so that not any operating system can relocate ranges because they need to do uh, you know devices may be added, they have re uh, ranges, and so they, they they should be able to relocate all the ranges. Uh, so I don't think there is a generic way to know where the where the, the, the you know relocation of the ranges is legal or not. Um, um, again, with a virtualized environment, you can prevent it at runtime. Exactly. In the last latest mitigation that you show in your laptop, you show that the the MIO bar uh, register has been uh, restored, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what I was wondering. Uh, in, in that case, you can't do for each SMI handler the same things because maybe someone needs to do legally. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get it. So you cannot you cannot do the same mitigation for all the SMI handlers. That's uh, that's uh, that's your question. I um, um, I think you're correct that it's not a very generic mitigation. Um, and that's why there are like three options that, you, that, that the firmware should consider. And a kind of combination of those three options should be implemented, I think. But it also works for if you, if you know, because the SMI handlers are, you know, shouldn't be installed at runtime. They should be fixed. So you know, uh, you know where each SMI handler is, uh, is, um, is uh, you know, which device it's communicating with, which uh, uh, MMI range it's uh, uh, writing to or reading from. Uh, and in that case, it might be a, uh, a relatively generic mitigation uh, because you know that in advance. Um, um, but yeah, I think it's a combination of three options that should be there. Yes, that's the, exactly the question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, I had actually a suggestion maybe for possible additional mitigation. For some devices that uh, should not be normally relocated by the OS, like uh, the same SPI controller, maybe the firmware could just store the, uh, the bar and uh, not read it from the device each time. Mm -hmm. Yep, except when you store the bar, the cache, the value, uh, let's say 
uh, OS or exploit code relocates it, you're still writing to your original value because you cached it and you're not using it, not reading from the device. But then you're not really talking to the device, right? For, uh, yeah, see. the functionality is broken, but you don't care because this is an attack. The trouble is it's, not, it's more than the functionality is broken. The, 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 the exploit code might force you to uh, uh, read writes to the cached location, which now might be used by something else. Okay, thanks. So there's a potential for the issue here. That's why this option three is, uh, is more of a, you, you do cache that uh, beforehand when the firmware boots, but you also force the, uh, the, the, uh, this default location into the actual registers so you know that you are actually talking to the device as well, so yeah. All right, uh, I think that's time for the next presenter. Yeah, thank you.